Transistors are extremely important elements in electronics, as they allow us to do countless things in both analog and digital electronics. One of the most important types is the MOSFET transistors. Their name stands for Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor. How do MOSFETs differ from bipolar transistors? There are some key differences that make them better for certain aspects. First, we have the symbol which in this case also has two variants, N-type and P-type. Then we have the control methodology. While bipolar transistors are current control devices, MOSFETs are voltage control devices. In a bipolar transistor, we control its saturation through a base current multiplied by its gain. In a MOSFET, we aim to apply a voltage to the gate so that the resistance from drain to source is as low as possible. This voltage obviously has a limit, which is usually 20 to 30 volts. You should always check the value set in the datasheet. Unlike bipolar transistors, the gate does not have a current flow, or at least it's not relevant in most cases. So we don't use a direct resistor to the gate. However, it is recommended to place a resistor, for example 10K, from the gate to the ground, in the case of N-type and from BSS to gate, in the P-type, to keep the MOSFET optimally turned off. We must also keep in mind that MOSFETs are delicate flowers when it comes to the gate, which is their weak point. We must be very careful about what kind of outputs control the gate of a MOSFET. What are the operational differences between N-type and P-type MOSFETs? They are very simple. To turn on an N-type MOSFET, the voltage at the gate must be higher than the source. This is why we usually use the MOSFET in common source or ground, so the gate voltage is always higher. In P-type, it's the opposite. The gate voltage must be lower than the source, which is why we usually bring the gate to zero volts to activate. Commonly, in switching or load control applications, we use N-type since it follows direct logic, but both types fundamentally have the same functionality. Do you have a project that needs to be finished? Do you have an idea for a product and you want to take it to the next level? We are your best choice. In Prisma SEM Network, we have the best team to do so. We offer services on hardware design and software design. From PCB development, firmware development, app development, and desktop development. We offer competitive prices and an excellent service. Contact us to get a quote. All of the info available at the video description. What operational factors do we need to know about them to implement a transistor? Let's look at the most relevant factors using the IRF540 and type MOSFET. First, we have the gate voltage, which in this case is 20 volts. As we mentioned earlier, we must be very delicate with the gate as it is the Achilles heels of the transistor. Always respect this value. Next, we have the drain to source voltage, specified at 100 volts. This value will vary between MOSFETs. Some will support higher voltages, while others have lower voltages. So always check that our model in question can handle the load we need. Then we have the drain current, specified at 20 amps. Here is where we need to be extremely careful. As we can see, the datasheet indicates a value of 20 amps continuous at a maximum operating temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. Although it is not recommended to have a MOSFET operating at this temperature, it is possible. What should we be careful about? Well, we must consider the internal resistance, which is the next parameter. Internal resistance is the resistance value from drain to source given at a gate voltage. In this case, it specifies an internal resistance of 77 milliohms with a gate voltage of 10 volts. What does internal resistance indicate? It indicates how much the transistor will heat up under certain current. Using Watt's law, we can determine the power dissipated as heat, which is current squared times resistance. If we had a 20 amps and an internal resistance of 77 milliohms, we get 30.8 watts. Now, with this power value, we translate it to thermal resistance. The thermal resistance is the relationship between temperature increase and dissipated power. 
If we don't have a heat sink on the MOSFET, the indicated thermal resistance is 62 degrees per watt. Multiplying 62 times 30 gives us 1820 degrees Celsius. We can see that it is impossible for the MOSFET to operate at these current levels continuously without passive or even active dissipation. This is the precaution we must take into account so that we don't burn the MOSFET. We will need very low thermal resistance values, for example, 2 degrees Celsius per watt, which implies a large heat sink or the inclusion of active cooling, such as a fan. Also, considering that thermal resistance increases as temperature rises, we could destabilize the MOSFET if we don't take care of this aspect. We can see then that although the MOSFET can support higher maximum currents than a bipolar counterpart in similar packages, we we'll still need to be very careful with this aspect. In the MOSFET efficiency testing video, we can see this comparison more effectively. I recommend watching it once you finish this video. Well, now let's do some physical tests with the MOSFET to verify the essential datasheet parameters. So now we are controlling directly our MOSFET using the output of the, of the microcontroller. And we can see that we have quite an odd waveform, even though it appears as it is actually switching and the waveform is actually the drain of the MOSFET, we can see that something strange is going on. We have an inverter logic because we are using a, an open drain configuration. We have a, an n-channel MOSFET we can see the values we are measuring and things seems to be fine but at the same time they seem to be not fine and we are continuously going to test and come to the conclusion that something is not right but at least we can see that the MOSFET is somewhat switching at this point so now we are testing it with a load and we can see that the output is nowhere near as it should be the output of the MOSFET is not behaving at all as it should be. There's something wrong. But what is going on? Why are we getting a proper input signal, but we are getting such a screwed output signal? Let's see what is happening. Now, we will encounter a problem with this particular MOSFET when using a 3.3 volt signal. We just saw that indeed the MOSFET gives us a signal on the drain making us believe it is working as it should. But we have a problem. MOSFETs need a minimum voltage to activate. But the trap is that although they activate with a minimum voltage, it does not mean they will work properly, given that their internal resistance is too high. Usually, when a MOSFET indicates an RDS value with a given voltage, it means we should use it at an amplitude at the gate equal two or greater, with the maximum obviously being the top value. When we have cases like this, we say that the MOSFET is not logic level, meaning it will not work directly with the yellow level values, which are usually 5 volts, 3.3 volts, etc. Although there are logic level MOSFETs, they are not usually of considerable power. Does this mean we won't be able to work directly with it in any way? No, fortunately we have different solutions. It all comes down to amplifying the voltage. We could use an MPN transistor with a common emitter to amplify the voltage. Although, we will end up inverting the logic. We could use a PNP transistor to avoid this logic conversion. At the same time, we could use an op-amp to amplify the signal following the same logic. Finally, we have the option of using MOSFET drivers although they may be more expensive to implement since the conditions in which we need to use the MOSFET drivers are a bit more complicated. We will leave that topic to another video. In this case, we will use the gate control solution with an MPN transistor 
since it is the cheapest and most effective for our application. So now we can see the setup we have. We have the MPN transistor controlling the gate of the MOSFET transistor. And we can see the output in the oscilloscope. We have an inverted logic. So now we have our dissipation test. We have our first multimeter checking our current, our second multimeter checking the temperature of the MOSFET, and then we have the output signal in our oscilloscope. We can see that with a small current we have a very small increase in temperature. But we are going to increase the current controlling the PWM duty cycle up to 100 milliamps and then we have our increase in the temperature of the MOSFET. We have to remember that we are not using a heatsink. As we can see, the MOSFET is still placed in the power board. So the room temperature is 26 degrees Celsius and we are seeing an increase up to 40 something degrees Celsius. So now we are going beyond 20 degrees Celsius in difference of temperature. And if we increase the current even more, up to 1.5 amps we can see that the temperature rise is going to be quicker we are going beyond 60 degrees which is still in the safe zone but the temperature will keep rising and then eventually will become an issue now we are above 70 degrees Celsius At this rate we can expect to be reaching above 90 degrees quite quickly and if we notice the current is dropping a little bit because the resistance inside the MOSFET is going to increase with temperature so not only are we increasing the temperature we are also seeing a diminish in the power capabilities of the MOSFET because the power capabilities are only guaranteed at certain temperature ranges. So we are very close to reach 90 degrees. We are seeing a lesser increase in temperature or a slower increase in temperature, but we can expect to reach above 100 degrees over a couple minutes. So we are going to stop the test and see the next case. So for the second case, we are going to be using a heatsink. This is not a large heatsink by any means, but it is bigger and will provide a lower thermal resistance so that we can manage higher currents or higher power. We can see that now we are going to be operating quickly at 1.4 amps and we are seeing that we have a 29 degree Celsius total uh, measured temperature at the MOSFET. 
So in the previous test, we were reaching above 80 degrees Celsius at these same conditions. And now we are seeing that we are only a few degrees above the room temperature. In this case, we can see how much of a difference having a heat sink makes. This is not a large heat sink by any means. This is not a heat sink that will provide such a big uh, passive uh, dissipation. But we are effectively lowering the thermal resistance of the MOSFET. And we can see that it is making a huge impact on the performance of the MOSFET. Because only having 3 degrees of, of difference between room temperature and operating temperature is something amazing. Now obviously we wouldn't be reaching this much efficiency with a bipolar transistor by any means, but we can see how MOSFETs really are so efficient. And we are using a, a kind of a general consumer or a uh, ancient MOSFET, let's say. We are not using the top of the top. We can even get lower internal resistances. We can get better performances. And that is why MOSFETs are so, so important in power electronics. We can see this test process. We are not using a high current by any means as well, but we are not using something in the milliamp range as well. So let's vary the, the current again. Let's go a little higher. Now at 2 amps. And we obviously are going to see some rise. but not by very much. I expect the temperature to settle around 32 degrees, 33 degrees Celsius. So at two amps, we only have a four degree difference rating which is very nice well now that we have seen the theoretical margin and tests it's time to reach some conclusions first MOSFETs are transistors that offer us notable advantages as they are more efficient than bipolar transistors and allows us to control loads more easily. At the same time, we must take extreme precautions with the gate to avoid damaging it due to any carelessness. Undoubtedly, they should be our primary choice when it comes to controlling loads in the form of switching, whether by an on-off or PWM control. However, we do not completely replace bipolar transistors. They still have their place in certain conditions. So for our setup, we are going to be using something very simple. We are going to be using an ESP32 as our microcontroller, which is going to be generating the PWM output. We can see we have an output of 3.3 volts at peak, which is a logic level expected by these microcontrollers. We have two buttons. We are going to increase and decrease the pulse width modulation or, or the duty cycle. And that is how we are going to control our MOSFET.